All right, greetings, greetings. Um, welcome. We're going to start our May NABA quarterly meeting. And um, well, if we had attendees, I had a couple of questions, but let's just start. Um, here we have different organisms that occur in Pine Rocklands. And if you've checked out the recent news, there was a newly discovered species in the Richmond Pinelands. So since we have panelists here, out of the different letters, A, B, C, D, and E, uh, which one was the newly discovered species? E. Did you say E? Yes. Yeah, so that's the Pine Rockland Trapdoor Spider. Uh, was newly discovered in the Richmond Pine Rocklands. And then we have a, a, of the different letters, um, there's the species that no longer exists in the Richmond Pine Rocklands. Now, for those of you who are good with the butterflies, which one is it? E. Say it again? E. No, 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 the second question right here. So which one no longer exists in the Richmond Pine Rocklands? It's either A, B, C, or D. D. And as in dog and, and, and Mary Rose, I'm assuming you know that that is the Florida leaf wing. So yes, the Florida leaf wing used to occur in the Richmond Pine Rocklands, but now it only uh, exists in Everglades National Park. And here are some other species that do live in the Richmond Pine Rocklands, the dusky wing and the Bartrell scrub hair streak. If you want orientation to it, the Richmond Pine Rocklands is near the Zoo Miami area. Um, so if you're curious about butterflies, moths and skippers with a strong emphasis on the butterflies, you should consider becoming a member. But how? Well, let me tell you how. If you go to the website down here, miamiblue.org let me get the pointer miamiblue.org um, if you click on there's going to be a link at the bottom of the page where you can look for the NABA membership and so this is what you will see um, and then here are your benefits of becoming a member um, so you would basically scroll down to here with this is on the first page so you should consider becoming a member if you care uh, and are not concerned about butterfly knowledge um, sightings and conservation and if you have a butterfly garden um, you should definitely check out Linda Evans favorite butterfly plants if you click on that uh, page right there you can see what kind of plants she thinks are uh, good plants for your yard and we also uh, have links to where you can get those plants. A lot of these plants are not gonna be found at the big box stores like Lowe's and Home Depot. So we were gonna do this game, but we don't have time for that. The whole point is that there are subspecies that look like the shell swallowtail in the Florida Keys, but they have slightly very uh, varied color uh, colorations and they exist throughout the Caribbean. So here, we have some in Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic. This one exists in the Turks and Caicos. This one is in the Crooked Islands. This is our endemic species in the Florida Keys. And then this one exists in Cuba. And the one thing they all have in common is that they all live in tropical dry forests. And they use um, amorous uh, torchwood as a host plant. So um, I'm going to introduce uh, our president, Dennis Ali, and he's going to welcome everybody. Hey folks, uh, welcome to our quarterly meeting. I apologize that we have had a system failure. So we have no non officers who are attending other than Sandy, but we'll go forward anyway. We're recording this. Jason, if you can uh, introduce our guest speaker. All right, so our guest speaker today is Dr. Robert McElderry. He is an ecologist and demographer. Um, 
recently, I mean, I, I, so he's a postdoc researcher um, at the University of Guam, but then just recently talking to him, you are um, still connected to, still affiliated with the University of Tennessee, correct? I just started back in April, yes. Okay. Um, and so he uh, did his PhD, his dissertation uh, at the University of Miami and worked with the Florida Leaf Wing. So this is the guy to talk to about Florida Leaf Wing population dynamics. Now, this is um, of a great concern in South Florida because as we know that, that the shout swallowtail is very rare, but if you're talking about another rare butterfly, the leaf wing is another one. And so um, um, he um, is going to present, uh, his title is host, uh, specificity, life history, and seasonality of North American leaf wings. But before he does that, I would like to direct you to his dissertation, which you can read online. I've read it. It is, it's really good. Um, it can provide um, solutions, not only for the leaf wing, but for some of the other rare butterflies in South Florida. So here's the title of his dissertation. And then he's published a lot of papers, but I'm just noting one of the papers um, in particular to the leaf wing, which is uh, population viability models for an endangered endemic subtropical butterfly that was published in the journal Biodiversity and Conservation. So you should also check that out. And I believe it's available um, through ResearchGate or Google Scholar. If you go to this Google Scholar link, you can see all of his publications and see that he's doing a lot of good work um, in regards to trying to figure out uh, what's going on with some of these rare and endemic species and how we can monitor them, but more importantly, prevent their extinction. So um, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Robert McElderry. Thank you. Um, I'd like to say it's, it's a pleasure to meet with you guys again. Um, I, I moved away from South Florida after graduating in 2015, so it's, it's been a little while. Um, and I've, I've been traveling around a little bit and studying different systems. I've worked on harlequin bugs in Southern California. I've worked on uh, the blue-eyed Mary, Kalinzia verna and looking at evolution of selfing syndrome in this little annual plant in, uh, in Tennessee and Pennsylvania. Um, most recently in Guam, I was looking at um, the potential for reintroducing birds on an island where they haven't been able to eradicate the invasive snake here. This was an island that previously had no snakes. There are no predators to this new invasive snake, and it's eaten all the forest birds. And so I was doing that just as a, as a modeling thing. Um, uh, as Jay pointed out, I think underlying a lot of this is thinking about endemic and endangered species and thinking about what we can, you know, how we can help. And, and I take a very quantitative approach. Um, and, and I'm going to show you some quantitative stuff today that I've been working on or that I did during my dissertation. Um, but, but I'm sure um, I, I like trying to practice explaining it in, in real terms and, and try and get out of the technical jargon. But please, as I go through, if something's not clear, um, stop me and let's talk about it. And because um, I think some of this stuff is interesting. And, and in general, in talking about life history and life cycle dynamics, um, we all have some kind of intuition on, on how that works. And we can kind of think about that in human terms, but also, especially with this group, you guys know very well the life cycle of butterflies. So, um, so hopefully you'll find some of this interesting. I'm gonna go ahead and share screens so you can see my slideshow. And it looks like that's showing. So just stop me if it's not. Um, yeah, so this is the title of the talk today. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the host specificity of the leaf wings, their life history, which in using that term, I mean like the schedule of events in a lifetime. Seasonality, uh, I think is a really important one. And that's something that I spent a lot of time thinking about. And because the Florida leaf wing is so rare, I found out pretty early on if I wanted to 
work with leaf wings at all, I needed to branch out and, and study some of the more common leaf wings because um, as many of you know, the Florida leaf wing is, is still dwindling and, and not very abundant. Um, now we're switching very slowly. All right. So for anyone who doesn't know, the Pine Rock Ridge, you can follow my, my pointer here. The Pine Rock Ridge in, in or Miami Rock Ridge in Southern Florida is a limestone ridge, a very low limestone ridge, but um, pronounced and super important for the ecosystem here. But this is the upland in Southern Florida and it's hard rock. You get this pine forest that grows directly on the rock and often you can just see stone riddled with solution holes and stuff like that and not much litter on it. This is the habitat where this beautiful little butterfly exists. And I really liked this butterfly because it's not, I mean, you see plenty of butterflies in a field and you picture, you know, walking through a meadow and everything's beautiful and this butterfly's flittering around. This guy sticks to pretty harsh environments, I think. Everywhere I studied it was, was fairly intense, I think, for, for what you would consider a butterfly. But my point here is that the Rockland is also where all of development has occurred in South Florida. And you know this very well, 90% of the habitat has been lost. Long Pine Key is what's shown here in Everglades National Park. And this is the lone outpost for um, the Florida leaf wing, despite its host plant being in some of these other fragments. Um, so it's, it's in a really poor state. I reached out to uh, my collaborator on the paper that Jason was showing you, Mark Salvato, and he shared his data with me. That's how we did that population viability analysis. Him and his wife, Holly, have visited the Pine Rocklands pretty much every month for the last 16 years. And they've, they've been slowed down, I think, a little bit now with COVID. Um, but they documented the decline of this species. And I'll show you some figures here in a second. And, and unfortunately, I reached out to him to ask how leaf wings are doing. And he said, they're still scraping by. They're not very abundant. Um, although you can go some places in the Pine Rocklands and, and still find them. So this is the study species. I'll point out that this butterfly has relatives throughout the West Indies. So you have different species or subspecies on various islands here. And um, I'll be talking some about the host plants that are available for these guys. I focused my work on these three leaf wings. We have um, Adia, Andrea, and uh, Floridalis here, the Florida leaf wing. So, and I call these the, for ease, the tropical leaf wing, the temperate leaf wing, and the Florida leaf wing. So you have a Florida leaf wing restricted to South Florida. A temperate leaf wing is noted throughout the US, primarily the Southeastern US, but it has some northern distribution as well. And then the tropical leaf wing is throughout uh, tropical Latin America, um, not, not past Costa Rica, I believe. And uh, we found it in Southern Texas as well. And so we were able to study both the tropical and temperate leaf wing together in in uh, Southern Texas. For an overview, and I won't spend a lot of detail talking about a lot of this stuff, but these are some of my findings. Um, so how vulnerable is the last Florida leaf wing population? When I analyzed this a few years ago and did projections forward, there's a lot of error in these projections, but you know, there's, there's a fairly low chance of extinction within 20 years. I mean, 8% is not high, but if you think about something going extinct, that's that's not it's not a great number. There's a lot of variance around that, you know, from like one to 78%. And then we were trying to look at if like the fire frequency in the counts and stuff. And what we found was that fire improves, seems to improve the carrying capacity for the population, and which helps to decrease some extinction risk a little bit. And we know these are these are fire prone and fire dependent habitats where this butterfly is occurring. I spent some time thinking about how specialized the leaf wings were to their local host plant. Uh, we know the Florida leaf wing has a single host, but there's also only one croton really that's, that's 
existing in, in that landscape. I know there's a, there's a beach croton, I'm forgetting the name of that right now. So there are some other crotons nearby and then other crotons throughout the state of Florida. So, you know, what, what are the chances that this butterfly could feed on some of the other crotons? And so I look at that a little bit. And then um, being a population demographer, um, I looked at the level of recruitment in nature. So how many uh, eggs and juveniles are coming up through and making it into adults and looking at predation a certain amount on that. Um, and then seasonality and, and how that contributes to the overall population dynamics. Because there are, if you've learned much about these butterflies and some of their relatives, they have distinct seasonal forms. In the tropics, it's a wet season, dry season form. And in the temperate zones, it's a winter and, and summer form. So you have these different life forms. How much do they matter? I did some experiments to, to estimate that. So looking at the vulnerability, the viability of the Florida leaf wing population, I mentioned Mark and Holly Salvato dedicating their time um, into doing these uh, uh, survey counts. Um, again, here's another instance of people just out of the kindness of their own heart. I mean, he does have a job working with endangered uh, uh, insects, but this was not exactly part of his job description. He was doing this out of you know, passion and desire to help butterflies. Um, so they went and counted butterflies. And, and as many of you know, we've gone you know, uh, uh, counts and butterfly walks, it's hit and miss sometimes. So teasing through the error on that was fairly difficult, or at least it took some statistical models. But I was able to get a pretty good fit in thinking about there being a peak each year in, in butterfly abundance. And it seemed like the data was showing that. So you can kind of see each year, this is 1999 to 2004, 14, sorry. And then these are the months of the year from January to January. Or no, I'm sorry, that's June to July. Um, but you can see a hump each year, which is uh, in the early dry season, I think, in late January for most of these. But where in 99, maybe these are healthy populations, you can see a, pretty much a decline. There's a bit of a peak again, but it just continues to decline. So overall, that's, that's what we were finding. Um, much lower numbers, and you'll notice that if you go out and look behind Rocklands, they're, they're not so easy to find, but you could get lucky. Um, but according to Mark, they're, they're staying low right now. They're not, they're not bouncing back. And that could be for a number of reasons. Uh, uh, fire is important in this environment, but if you, if you talk to the um, managers for Everglades National Park that are managing fire, they have so many endangered species to consider when there's a fire. It's, and, and you know some fires happen naturally, some don't, what season to burn. Um, and maybe things have changed since I last heard. It's, it's been a number of years. But it's, it's very difficult for them to, to manage fire and decide what's best for all species and stuff. Um, but so that's kind of the, the state of the leaf wings at this point. Um, and so this is where I pivoted to, to see if we can learn something from some of the other leaf wings uh, that we can generalize and bring back to, to the Florida leaf wing to better understand its biology. Um, I think I've summarized that pretty well. So I'm thinking about specialization, the reason I got into butterflies, I was telling Sandy earlier, um, I've been a plant person. I'm a classically trained taxonomist, or I was for a while, and worked a long time in plants. And in, I, I was fascinated with, with the, the close relationship between butterflies in particular. Plants. There are a lot of insects, but you know, butterflies in particular, I think, have a really close relationship. So if we look at the genus Ennea. These are the butterflies I was showing you uh, throughout the Caribbean. And these, this is the list of crotons. This is the genus croton, and these are all different species of, of known host plants that I found in the literature for each of these butterflies. And so you can, you can see most of them, you have a couple up here with five or four known hosts. Florida Alice only has one known host, but some of these others have two or three. Um, Coincidentally, croton is a highly diverse genus in the Caribbean. 
Um, so that's an interesting thing. And I think that's why on some of these smaller islands, the Aenea there, the representative Aenea has a number of host plants. So I was focusing on the temperate and tropical in Florida. And so you could kind of maybe loosely in this group call the temperate and tropical butterflies generalist. I've, I've seen them feeding on a number of, of host plants um, versus these intermediate ones. And I have Cascarilla here, that's been a new taxonomic name. That's the same as, it's Linearis in, in the um, pine rockwoods. And then, so for the temperate species, I was able to find these three plants, the top two are annuals, and the second, or the third one, Argyranthemus, is a, a herbaceous perennial, and that one's in North Florida. These other ones, I think you can, I think they're listed for North Florida. I was studying them in Texas. And then Cascarilla, which is the Linearis, I collected in South Florida. And Fruticulosis is another shrub, a shrubby croton with much larger leaves than that, than the Linearis. And this is what I was finding in uh, South Texas as a host. So when I originally set out to do this experiment, I thought I was gonna study this temperate butterfly in Austin, Texas, and in Gainesville, Florida, and then compare it to the Florida leaf wing. Of course, I wasn't able to do any tests with the Florida leaf wing because it's too rare. But then also, as I was looking at the temperate leaf wing, I collected caterpillars and started bringing them back in the lab and was raising them. And I started noticing very different horn morphology on the caterpillar head capsules. And if you notice in some of the pictures that Jay was showing, I was remembering, uh, the Florida leaf wing has orange dots all over its head, which these guys do not have, um, which I found quite interesting because also Croton linearis puts out more of this orange sap than all of the other crotons that, that, that I study. Um, so I thought that was an interesting thing. But in looking at the caterpillars, for anybody who's, I, I geeked out on caterpillars for a while. For anybody who geeks out on caterpillars, I was really interested in this morphology that you could have. So you could tell a difference in the caterpillars after you've raised a couple hundred of them, all of a sudden it's like, oh wait, these are different. They're very different. Um, so, so that's when I found out I actually had the tropical species over here in, in Texas. So I had to go back and get more of the temperate species as well. And then to show you for the host plants, I had the Argyranthemus, which I think maybe is like silver leaved croton um, in, reading the name of the park right now, San Falasco Park in Gainesville, um, where you could find caterpillars consuming this plant. Uh, the Croton linearis or Cascarilla from South Florida. These two annual plants I was able to collect in Texas. And then this shrub I was able to propagate from cuttings. And I did all of this in South Florida. And I raised caterpillars from both Texas and from, from um, northern Florida on each of these hosts. And, and the way I categorize them as are as the local host, because it got a little confusing with all these species and who was the local host and who was whatever. Um, so I'll explain, if we look at this red column here, for the tropical species, this was the croton that I found it eating on in its local site. So this is the local host. In the literature, it's known to use Croton linearis, the, the one in the Everglades, which is non-local, but it's listed as a host. So that's a non-local host. And so you can see in terms of the proportion surviving, the time to pupation and pupa mass, um, these two, it did quite well. on. So it does well on its local host, and it also does well on its non-local there are these other local non-hosts. I call them non-hosts because in the literature, they're not supposed to be eating them. And, and in fact, when I searched all of these plants, I searched hundreds and hundreds of, of these little plants in Texas, I never found the tropical leaf wing once on the, on the annual plants. It was always on the shrub. But when I fed them in the lab, the, the caterpillars actually did quite well on, on this non-local host or local non-host. The non-local non-host here is the silver croton from Northern Florida, which more than the croton linearis had 
a, a lot, a lot, a lot of threat set. And, and I think, you know, none of these, zero surviving, so there's no time to keep patient, there's no keep a mask. None of these caterpillars could survive on that curve. And in fact, even that's the local host here, you can see it's a very low proportion surviving for the, these are the Florida butterflies on the Florida local host, and they don't really do so well. They did come up with a large mass. They grew fat when they made it, but it was a very small proportion. And in fact, these butterflies also did well on some of the annual plants. So that's in, in summary of what I found in that study where, you know, some of these, these annual crotons seem to be maybe less protected. There's a lot less sap in them. And all of these butterflies did pretty well on these annual crotons that you can get seeds for fairly easily. Um, but, um, but, but I do think there's a pretty strong, I, I saw these results and, and thought, you know, it was a pretty strong signal of host specificity. Um, I would imagine that the Florida leaf wing might do well on this other shrub. And there are some other shrubby, you know, closely related to current linearis, it's, it's local host, that it might do well. Any questions on that? It's gonna... I, I have a quick question about that. So, yeah. um, I mean, obviously you need, you know, several permits for this, but you're saying it's a potential to study the Florida leaf wing and maybe give it some of the crotons that are in the Caribbean. And, and then kind of track your survival and, and days of pupation and stuff like that? As I a laboratory, as a laboratory study. Not yeah, and I thought about that. I, I think it would be interesting, but I think it'd mostly be interesting if, if you have a plan to, to, to create new habitat with that, with that host, or, or maybe if you were gonna do captive rearing, I think you know, it might make sense to try some others. Um, because the, the Croton linearis has narrow, hard leaves. Um, I also, and I think maybe I don't have it so much in this talk, you know, the leaves are about as wide as a caterpillar, so they're not able to, to do leaf rolls, which may put them at higher risk of parasitoids and, and predators and stuff. In the next section, I, I uh, track caterpillars through time, and, and I score their, their cause of death and stuff like that. And, and these butterflies need, the, the leaf roll provides a fair amount of protection as does the frass chain when they're, when they're really small. So some of that could factor in here. Also the, this other shrub from South Texas had pretty soft leaves um, in, com in comparison to the, to the crow linearis. And it seems like you can see in this figure, this is crow linearis. It takes them a much longer time to pupate than it does on this other shrub. So they, they survive a bit less, they can make it, but it just takes them longer. And I think it takes them longer to process um, a, a more defended leaf. Robert, I've got some questions about the last couple slides too. Mm -hmm. um, the first question is when you go back to the population, uh, the one that you had all the years, I think the, uh, don't you think the rain and hurricane uh, had a lot to do with the host plant availability? And that would describe why it wasn't the plant so much as it was the availability during the, uh, you know, like in 2004 and 2005, we got slammed by hurricanes, mm -hmm. um, 2000. Uh, but then in 2012 and 2013, even tropical storms were very rare. So. I, you know, that host plant availability would obviously be associated directly with our, the water and especially in the pine rocklands. Mm -hmm. Did you take that into account at all? Or is it, was it just the fire after, after fire? Um, so I did, I tried to put hurricanes in there, but in terms of statistics, it, it was difficult to, to have strength on, on measuring that. Um, okay. I, I do think it, it had an effect on it. Um, it was, it was just, it was difficult to make projections based on, on the, the weak amount of, of information that is in like linking that to a demographic model. Um, I, I really think the 
quality of the host plants is, is pretty important on these. Um, you know, and, and in thinking about how fire works here with, with the crotons, is they will, they can burn down to the ground and then resprout. But when I've seen resprouting, it's it's you know the greener, thinner, uh, uh, more lush uh, foliage, and they grow tighter together. Which there have been um, at least one observation of leaf wing webbing multiple leaves together okay. if they're close enough. But if you you know so uh, Curlinearis tends to have more sparse leaves to where it's it's unable to do that, and so it might provide a better environment for it. It might provide a better food and stuff if it has a good kind of disturbance like fire, which it resprouts from. If it's getting, um, you know, if there's any kind of salt water intrusion or anything that's just right. causing the plant to, its growth to stagnate, it's not gonna be good. And that's, I mean, you know, you think about it, if they get all of their nutrition through the leaves and if they don't have healthy leaves, then they are also right. not gonna be healthy. Lydia has another question about fire, and then I've got a question about host plants. So let's mm -hmm. talk about fire. Um, Lydia, do you want to un unmute? Yeah, sure. So just taking the information from the presentation, I think Robert writes here that there were no fires also after 2008. And there were actually no fires for like 10 years in Long Pine Key and they didn't start burning until 2016. So yeah, that, that, that could be a big factor, no fires. Um, you see the sum counts are really low. So that's, that could be a cause for decline there. Yeah, and I would, I would visit during that time period. Um, I, I went there every year from 2010 to 2014, I think. And the crotons I would search would often be covered in, in a little black mold or something. And, you know, I mean, they just, I, I started thinking like a butterfly after raising hundreds of them and feeding them. I was like, this does not look tasty. You know, I, I, they don't look like healthy leaves for them to be eating. And so, and not that there weren't good host plants out there, but I think, I, I think there is something to, you know, the, the availability of, of good host plants in this environment. And then my question goes right into that because if you were rearing them only on croton from ENP and not from say Virginia or, or um, Navy Wells or any other croton, then that would be affecting the, 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 the larvae as well because if that was the only place and I'm sure there's nutritional differences Mm -hmm. in those plants from those different pine rockland areas. Yeah, but I do think, I think, you know, I mean, the, the, that could be some of it, but um, I feel like some of the results show that even if they're not, if that plant doesn't grow directly in their area, you know, they have some adaptation to be able to, to consume that. So that's like this tropical leaf wing from Texas did fairly well on the, on the croton from South Florida. Um, and, you know, it took it longer. And, and so certainly this would matter in the field. And, and so you could kind of see, I could definitely imagine, you know, small nutritional differences between different sites and different habitats. Um, especially with different quality of, of different habitats and different qualities of the rocklands and stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to talk about recruitment. This was one of my favorite parts of the study. I spent um, months where every day I went and visited, you know, the same plants. I had a three-day schedule where every three days I went back to the same plants. And, and followed caterpillars. And the reason I did that is because, you know, we commonly count butterflies because they're just, they're way easier to find. It's hard to find caterpillars. Um, and, and that's how we do population dynamics is we, 
you know, commonly we'll target a period where there's there's a brood, there's there's a peak in breeding abundance, and we'll see where they're just all taking wing for some reason or other. We count number of adults in one time period, and we count number of adults in the other time period, and that's how we think about changing populations over time. But and there's nothing wrong with that, but if we want to start understanding a little more about some of the underlying effects, then we might want to look at some of the you know, underlying demographics. And so in this graphic, I'm showing before the peak in adults, there's typically a peak in larvae. So you have these adults laying eggs and they're passing away as, as they're at the end of their life. And then their offspring grow and become adults. And so that's what I wanted to focus on. And yeah, investigate juvenile stage demographics to establish links between recruitment, the environment, and adult counts. Um, and what I mean by demographics, please don't spend too much time looking at all of these symbols here. Mostly I have, you know, everybody starts as an egg, every caterpillar does, they grow into a first instar, they shed their skin and their head capsule, and then become second instar, third, fourth, fifth, and eventually they pupate. And after pupa, they become an adult. And so these symbols just mean the probabilities of surviving, given they're in that stage, and of either remaining in that stage in my three-day time step or transitioning to the next stage. So when I come, so, so maybe one day I see a fourth in store. When I come back to the same plant, then I find a fifth in store. And that helps me to make this estimate. So how do you track caterpillars in the wild? Um, often it would not be very easy, but these guys are growing on small shrubs that are typically, typically less than a meter, sometimes up to maybe two meters. And, um, and they also, because they invest their time and effort into rolling leaves like this here, you can see a little bit of a frass chain there. They, they take their frass, their excrement, and they web it together coming from the tip of the leaf vein, and it just comes out, you know, the more they eat, the more they excrete, the more they make their frass chain. And when they're tiny little caterpillars, they climb out on that. I have some other pictures to show you with them on there. So I just marked, I had tagged plants that I mapped and I knew where they were, and I marked the leaf um, where they were occurring. So here's one where I marked A with an arrow because he was on this frass chain here. You can see he consumed the whole leaf. He later came over here, made a small leaf roll when he was an early fourth in store, third or fourth in store, they switched to rolling leaves. And then here he is um, backing down into, actually I think he's coming out and chasing this soldier bug off. This is a, this is a bug with a piercing mouthpiece. He has like a straw for a mouth and they stab these caterpillars and just suck all the juice out of them. But the benefit of this leaf roll is that they back down in it and keep their, it keeps their soft body parts protected and their hard head capsule faces out. And which I already showed you in the fourth instar, these guys have really large horns. So they really are the Texas longhorns of the leaf wing butterflies. Um, this caterpillar was able to fend this guy off and shove him away, but I have found dead caterpillar carcasses in leaf rolls where some insect had just bored a hole right down through the head capsule. So some larger bugs can get in and get this. Long story short, I tracked 510 individuals over nine censuses for over 2,700 observations, which I used to estimate all of the survival and transition rates. And I won't bore you with the estimates. I'll show you what they mean later. Um, where's my pointer? Here. Um, as I tracked them through time, I would commonly find dead caterpillars. Like I mentioned, I found some with holes bored in their face here, or I would find where it looked like a bird maybe had attacked because there were like chomp marks all over the leaf and the caterpillar was missing. Um, spiders would commonly smaller ones could come out on the frash chain and get a caterpillar and they would tend to web them to that. So you'd find them just stuck there and but like sucked dry, shriveled dry. So I was able to 
record deaths and record those that looked like they had been predated on. And so, and with this over the spring phenology, so I started um, just before April and then through to the end of April, you can see an increasing rate of the per capita predation rate, basically. So as this, as you have this brood happening, the, the predators in the environment apparently started, you know, honing in on that and, and really started targeting them at some point. So you can see as they grow, and I have another figure here showing that this is a hump-shaped brood, you know, where they, they just happened all at one time. Um, but I thought that was interesting. So there's, there's quite a bit of predation here that happens. And again, I mentioned for the Florida leaf wing that are unable to do these leaf rolls, they may, they may suffer higher predation than, than what I'm seeing here. The other thing that I was able to me measure is the, I just uh, collected the temperature data for the same days for the censuses. And so you can see with spring coming on in a temperate zone, it, it's variable and that affected the probability of transition. So underlying that, the, the growth rate, which is true of all insects in that their metabolism is dictated by the uh, environmental temperature around them to a large degree. And so you can see overall with increasing temperature, especially for the early instars that really increased their probability of being in the next stage at the next time step. So there's a temperature effect there. Um, and then I was also able to, with, all of the caterpillars that I've measured, it's really hard to find eggs. So I would find them at various stages. But in monitoring them through to their adulthood, well, really when they disappeared for adulthood, um, I was able to turn all those estimates around and project backward to estimate when they were born. And with that, I was able to, in spring and then also in fall, estimate the, the egg length. Um, for these habitats. You can see um, at the beginning of March, when things are still cold, there's still some frosts. Um, the adult leaf wing start to become active and they start laying eggs, but it's a pretty tight window on that. You know, they stop laying eggs by mid-April. And then in fall, they start in early September, and then they end in late October, which I'll bring this stuff back when I start talking about the seasonality these butterflies. Um, so yeah, survival, I compared it with lab measures. You know, it seemed like they, they an early instar survived better in the field than they did in, in the lab, which, you know, the lab are not uh, perfect conditions. Um, and, but, it, but it also it gave me a lot of information on the juvenile stage dynamics for the models that I built later. So, um, I'm gonna move on if there are any questions on this. Uh, feel free, and uh, we can pause and do that. Okay, so seasonality and the contribution to population dynamics. This is where I had to get creative with the model. Um, I mentioned before, I define life history as a schedule of lifetime events. Um, and then I mentioned also briefly that there are different seasonal forms, and I think they differ in survival, and obviously they differ in the timing of reproduction. Well, not obviously, I haven't told you yet, but if, if you know why they do this, you know, the winter form emerges uh, non-reproductively viable, and the summer form is reproductively viable. Um, and, but this got me thinking about trade-offs between survival and reproduction. This is something we talk about in life history theory, where, you know, you can either reproduce now and not invest in survival, or you can survive to later and then reproduce for, for a, a simple scenario. So you can think about a trade-off as one trade benefits at the cost of another. This cost is paid in the currency of fitness. And as demographers, we measure fitness as the average annual population growth. So this, this, that estimates the mean fitness of the population. And I really wanted to know if some life stage, some life stages or certain seasons have proportionally large effects on population growth. I think it's common when you're thinking about managing a population to look for those weak links and say, you know, 
if that's the weak link, then maybe we need to help in that point. And so that's that's some of my motivation. In thinking about seasonality, I started put the, putting together, this is, these are no data. I'm just thinking about what this might look like. And this is formed loosely by, by what I was seeing in the field. But you can think about it in North Temperate where there's a long winter, there's a pretty condensed summer season where if you're gonna get two broods in there and, and the report for these for this species is that they have two broods, um, you know, you're gonna have one in the spring and then one in the fall, and you should expect the adults to kind of follow like this. Um, so there's episodic pulsing breeding, which we call a brood. There's a recruitment phase of juvenile stages, which, you know, if you're not looking for caterpillars, you might miss, um, but this should precede the, the pulse in adult stages. If we move to the south temperate region, you know, so the southern U.S. where I was working, this is more representative of what I was seeing in Texas, where there's Shark spring brood. Often people don't know what's happening in the summer, or at least there are no reports. And so that's where you know our people are just not going out, because especially South Texas, it's hot, it's dry. But you know, maybe there aren't host plants as well. And then in the fall, there's another brood. Um, there's a possibility that that there is this summer pulse. And then being that we're thinking about the Florida leaf wing as well, um, I thought I would bring in the more of a you know, seasonal dry system where you have um, the dry season early in the year followed by the wet season. So maybe in South Florida, you might expect some of this, although my peaks were showing in January, but there are dry season, wet season for the, for the Florida leaf leaves. So this is just my way of, it, it's not based on data per se, it's just showing, you know, given the life cycle of this species, it's, it's fitting within a larger environmental oscillation, which especially when you're talking about a harsh winter, um, you know, there, there aren't many ways around. You just have to find a way to employ it. I found this really interesting paper by Torres et al. in Morelos, Mexico. And one of the species that they're listing here is um, an Enea. Um, so this is showing over the year, January, February to December, temperature is this flat line here. So it's a pretty constant temperature but it's a very dramatically uh, seasonal dry forest here where you have like no precipitation and then a lot of precipitation. And coincidentally, you see the abundance of butterflies that you could go and count in that same peak. And so this was a figure they had in there showing the, the, um, the, the hilltop here is shown by that arrow. And so you can see it's a very, very drastic difference in the wet and the dry season. But this is where these butterflies are living. Again, I mentioned these are not, you know, cute little meadows and they're just flittering around all pretty like some butterflies are. I mean, these guys are like, these butterflies are, are like, they're in really harsh environments. I was really impressed by that. And that's why I'm trying to impress it on you. Um, they linked the, because all the butterflies they were studying are nymphalids and they feed on rotting fruit as opposed to uh, nectar. And so that's a big part of what they're getting. And so this is dry season D, the W's wet season and the dry season. And this is the phenology of fruiting trees. And what they found is that, that you know, they had evidence suggesting that this peak in fruiting here, especially like ficus and, and spondy and stuff, um, that's producing a lot of fruit and rotting fruit for these butterflies that are persisting in this dry season over here. Where at the end of the dry season, they're like starving, they're like, they, any minute our host plant's gonna come up, and but we have to have some strength to start laying eggs. And so, yeah, I, 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 I'm still pretty impressed at how these butterflies are able to withstand all of this, get some food, and then when their plant pops up with the rain, they're ready to go. These are the habitats that I was working in. So at the bottom, many of you will recognize this is uh, Lone Pine Key. You can see uh, some of the um, pine rockland in the distance there over this uh, finger blade here of sawgrass. So this is the typical landscape in South Florida for the, for the leaf wing. These are two habitats that, that I would find frequently in South Texas where I was working. This is the small shrub. It gets taller than this, but the, 
This is what was in this cedar glade here. And then also in kind of a, not quite a river bottom, just up from that a little bit. Uh, there's host plant in among this grass too. But it was, in, in, in this habitat, it was all woodland, low oaks or cedars. And then I caught this leaf wing here, um, feeding on sap flow. So I think in this habitat, there aren't as many fruit producing trees, I think, as you would find in a tropical dry forest. Um, but they were noted, I, I noted them a lot more, and I think they're noted in some of the literature as um, hitting some of the sap flows. Um, but again, this they're fluttering around and they're hard to find and they disappear quickly in this prickly wooded environment, um, which it, it, I, I don't know. It, they were not the butterfly I was expecting, I'll put it that way. Their life cycle is standard. Uh, for butterflies, but I still think as a demographer, it's, it's fairly interesting. Um, but it requires them about two months to, to go through this cycle. And I've already talked about the trash chains that they spend time on and the poor Florida leaf wing cannot roll these leaves. You can see that that's a, that's a fourth inch star there. And he's about as wide as the leaf. But the other thing is that if you're gonna fit two cycles in here, the, the, the offspring of the summer form are going to emerge in a time where they're going to have to under, you know, endure the winter. So like you have the summer form that's enduring hot and dry conditions, and then the winter form is going to have to endure cold conditions. And so they've evolved different different physiological forms that, that you could pick out. And they were described as the summer form or the, the, that's also, I think the wet season form are capable of breeding immediately. When they emerge within a few days, if they have a pair and they copulate, then they can, the female can start laying eggs. The winter form on the other hand, I've, I've put them together and they just, they don't breed and they don't lay eggs for uh, at least over a month. I mean, there has to be some post-emergence development of their, of their reproductive organs, I believe. And what triggers this is day length. So if you have a lengthening day or a really long day where the days are getting longer during their late uh, instar, their, their late juvenile development, then they will emerge as a summer form. If they have short days, then they'll emerge as the winter form. So in the lab, I just set the day length on different growth chambers to either long or short day. And I grew up both forms in the lab. Morphologically, if you're out and about and you see these butterflies in different times of year, the summer form tends to have a blunt tip, whereas the, the winter form has more of a falcate tip. Uh, they're also darker, which I, just hypothesize here, maybe that absorbs more heat. And, and then I don't remember if I read that or if I'm just guessing at that. But I did find these, these were always lighter and in fact, kind of reflective almost on the other side um, as opposed to the winter form. And then, so I grew up summer form and winter form. And I subjected them to two different environments because the summer form and the winter form both engage in a different environment. In the summer form, they're focused on, if, you know, in, in my understanding, they're focused on breeding. You know, there's host plants available so they can breed, they can go lay eggs on host plants and their offspring can carry on. The winter form, the host plants are all gonna die out. They're all gonna lose their leaves for the most part, unless you're like really far south. Um, but even if it's, if it's dry season, you know, a lot of, the plants will drop their leaves as well. And so there's just no food for offspring, which puts it on the adult to survive and then breed. And what they do when they, so I read a lot about um, what butterflies do when they are uh, going dormant as adults. And they tend to find a quiet, cool place and hang out. And there are some studies that have said, you know, if, if there are more warm days during the winter or butterflies become active, they metabolize more and they use up critical stores that they have um, that they need to survive that length of period. So I took both of these forms and in one treatment, 
I had um, shade houses um, at the Fairchild Botanic Gardens, actually on the Montgomery Botanic Garden, because that's where their, their shade houses are um, for study. I had some shade houses there with meter cube cages that I had screened in that I put host plants in. And here I allowed the butterflies room to move around with ambient temperatures, warm temperatures um, for them to exist. And then for the alternative to simulate dormancy, there wasn't a really great way of doing that, but I figured inside in an air conditioned place that stays 70 degrees, um, I had them on low light, you know, not, I mean, they would get their diurnal darkness, but, you know, never like super bright light. And also I kept them in small cages. Um, and the reason being, if you give a butterfly space, they'll, they'll move around and they may, might try and beat themselves up. But if you enclose them, then they, and they would, they would just sit there. They would go down and feed. I fed them all uh, water with uh, banana mash daily. I would clean that out to, to do that fresh for both treatments. And then I just recorded their time to death. Um, I didn't allow them to breed because uh, that can be some cost. And what I found, I was pretty amazed by. You can see the summer form adults survived better in the active conditions. So where it was warmer when they were able to move around, they survived better than the winter form adults. Clearly the winter form adults were not, they, they weren't ready for um, warm temperatures and for activity and they didn't survive as long. But when we looked at the inactive conditions, the winter form, far outlived the summer form. The summer form did a little bit better. It was in, in conserving its energy and not moving around. They did live a little bit better. I'll point out also, this is a log scale. So this is a 40 times different. You know, they lived 40 times longer. Maximum life skip is span of 466 days, which that's not gonna happen in nature. You know, this is, this is in a controlled environment. Um, uh, I mean, it could, I, I highly doubt it. Um, but, but that's not the point. You know, they just need to live for a few months longer, really, than their summer form. Um, and, and so they can make it to the spring the following year and breed. But I, I thought this was really cool. Um, questions on that? Because I'm going to talk about how I put all of this into a model next, if you want to get a question. Yeah. Well, we're going to um, leave all the questions to the end. Okay. Uh, so you can get yeah. Am I okay on time? Yeah, no, you, good stuff. Just yeah, keep going. But we'll we'll just put we'll consolidate all the questions to the end though. Okay. All right. So this is a schematic kind of showing how how I put all of this together. And and again, don't worry yourself with the each of these letters means some kind of probability. This is a probabilistic model. But what it does is it projects eggs to, you know, throughout their life as a caterpillar. After they pupate, they're either going to be a summer adult or a winter adult. And I fix this by the time of year, because it's either going to be a lengthening day or a shortening day. As adults, they're able to lay eggs. And at some point, I added this in where I'm calling it quiescent adults. They're, they're going dormant. And so they have, a, they have the ability to be active where they can lay eggs or they can go and not be active. And, and I artificially put a slightly higher survival rate in that because they're not, and not really artificially, actually, I think I built that from, I'm remembering now, I built that from these estimates here. So if you're inactive, you, you get this inactive, um, survival rate, and if you're active, you get this one over here. Um, and so, yeah, these are just the functional forms for all of that, just to show there's, there's math underlying this. But as, in essence, what it does is it just projects an individual through every stage of its life from birth until death with reproduction in between. We represent that. Again, don't focus too much on or worry too much about this. But this is a, a matrix model. And so the matrix simply helps us keep tallies of who's going where. So if you're an egg, you have a chance. If you're an egg, this is time t across the top, time t plus one on the side, and this is your stage. If you're an egg at time t, in the next time step, you have a probability for mating an egg. 
or you can grow into first or second instar. And um, so on the diagonal of the matrix is the probability of surviving and remaining in a stage. So like as adults, it's the probability of surviving and remaining as a winter adult, or you can go into the quiescent stage. And so everything on the lower diagonal is growth. Everything on the upper diagonal is regression, which we know that you know, a third instar, for example, is never going to revert back to a second instar, at least not in this species. You have some butterflies and in, in, in moths with uh, supernumerary instars where they can just continually be fifth instar, but that's not what I'm doing here. I mainly have this because if you have these dormant adults, the, the quiescent adults, then they can go back to being active. So that's, that's just shown here. And then importantly, this is where reproduction happens. So if you're an adult, if you're in one of these stages, this is your contribution to the egg stage and the next time step. So in essence, this is just a way of putting all the demographic information together. Combining it in a matrix is the most complicated part, but really it, it represents a fairly simple process that I think you know, we can understand. And I'm happy to talk more about that because I know it's probably brand new for a lot of you. Um, but so we can just do these projections, and this was uh, this is how um, I'm just plotting out in a simulation of the model. These are the eggs being laid, and by whom? So the winter adults are laying eggs in the spring, and then their offspring are laying some adults through the summer, and then they have their peak in the in the fall. I found with with this timing that I matched to South Florida, this peak doesn't work unless there's some reproduction during the summer. And so, so I was able to, well, I mean, you know, in, in terms of, you know, cause these match what I measured in the field, but there's just not enough adults surviving to make this peak happen if there's not new reproduction during the summer for this. Um, and so this is showing what the adults are doing. The dashed lines are the dormant ones. The blue lines are winter form. The red lines are summer form. So you have winter form adults that, um, that go dormant in the, in the winter, and then they're surviving, there's no reproduction, so their numbers are steadily going down at the rate of their mortality. And then it, when spring happens, they're able to become active. And so this is, you could think about this, like if you were to go out and try and count butterflies, if you went here, you'd be seeing, which is true, I trapped butterflies during this time, I'm not showing this information, but the butterflies are notably older, they're a bit more tattered, they're of the winter form, um, not the summer form. But then late in May, you start seeing summer form adults. So they're, they're bright, they're vibrant, they're new, they have the blunted wing tips. Um, but in my models, the only way to make this fall brood happen was for these adults to go into the dormant state. And so at some point, I think during this month, because in South Texas, it gets super dry, especially during my dissertation, where there's just no, no foliage on the host plants um, for these butterflies. But so that's the model that I put together. And with that model, we can also analyze the matrix itself. And I won't bore you with the mathematical details, but just know if we, we, we can point some math at that matrix and get some information out of it. And what we get from it is the annual population growth rate. We get the stable stage distribution, and I'll show you what that is in a second, but basically it's the proportion of the population in each stage at each time. We can talk about the reproductive value of each stage at different times. And then we can also look at the elasticity or the sensitivity, which basically means how much the population growth rate would change if you change any one demographic rate. Um, so the top panel here is the stable stage distribution. And you can see it's changing over time. And that's because this is a seasonal model. So it starts in January on the x-axis here. This is date January, March, May, through to December. Um, so these are the quiescent adults, the dormant winter form adults. They're all dormant early in the winter. They emerge and become active and they start laying eggs 
the eggs then become first in store, second, third, fourth, fifth, eventually pupa, and then these pupa start becoming um, the, the summer adults, the active summer adults, which eventually also go dormant. So you could think about this as if you were to go out in nature. Um, at this time period, which is what I did, I was able to find a lot of these stages um, of caterpillars when I looked at the host plant. When I went in summertime, I found no stages. In, well, and that's not true. You would find some residual, um, but not as much because a lot of them would be adults and going somewhere else as well. Um, and then this is just reproductive value. And the only, I think, takeaway I think you should take from that is that the reproductive value changes with, with time over the year. So early in spring, any active adults have a very high reproductive value, which means you've made it to there um, and, and any offspring you lay are gonna be pretty important for the population. Whereas at, at, at when you're born, you have less value because the chances of you making it to here um, are lower than if you've actually been here. And then I won't talk about the elasticity on that because it gets a little complicated to talk about that. I will mention here in the elasticity, what this is showing, this big peak right here, so that the height of these peaks is the importance. And this peak identifies the survival and, and staying dormant. It's the survival of dormant adults that remain dormant. So that is over the life cycle, over that the whole annual, it's actually over two life cycles for these butterflies. It's, it's the most important demographic rate. And I think the, the main reason for that, what I've convinced myself of is all of these other stages, they go through relatively quickly. You know, the caterpillars aren't spending six months as a second instar. They're spending maybe six days, probably three days as a second instar. Um, and so they go through this part of their life much more rapidly, but it's these, this overwintering stage that's super important. If they don't make it, then, then there's nobody to lay eggs for the next stage, which is pretty critical if you consider any kind of warming that's going to be raising their metabolism, perhaps coaxing them out of, of whatever you know, crevice they've crawled into to, to remain for, for the winter, if, if they're encouraged to come out and they're metabolizing, which you know, raises their mortality rate, and the host plants still haven't come out, if there's a mismatch in that, then these butterflies could see more, um, more mortality during this stage, which would be pretty critical for overall for the life stage. And then this last one I'll just show quickly, if you focus in on the winter versus the spring versus the summer, that importance changes. You know, the one I showed you was that summed over the whole year, but if we just look at winter, there's only one stage there. And so of course it's important, um, but if you look at say the summer or the fall, some of these other life stages are important. So it's not to say that they're not important. There's still crucial links in it, but they just have a more narrow time window in that. Um, with this, there's a kind of an evolutionary component on that. And thinking about, um, so you could say the natural selection would favor in the breeding season, growth of juveniles and survival of summer form adults where reproduction is vital. In the winter, of course, survival of winter form adults is, is super important. And, but seeing this also would suggest why, why two functional forms have evolved, why the seasonal forms has, has evolved, because you can imagine that that takes some confusion. I mean, you know, we, doesn't matter when we're born, we're the same kinds of humans. And a lot of plants, a lot of animals, you know, would, would be the same. But for these butterflies, there's obviously um, a pretty strong reason why they have these, this, this genetic switch that's day length triggered that causes them to grow into these two very different forms. For leaf wing conservation overall, um, Knowing why they're endangered, of course, we have this extreme habitat loss that's very well known. Um, they're very specialized on their, on their host plants, which again, that's why I went into butterflies. Um, there are some alternatives. These, these annual crotons are pretty easy to propagate and they're pretty good hosts. 
Uh, Jay, you were asking some about some of the other um, um, shrubs in the in the Caribbean and if they could be hosts. And and that could be, I mean, the shrubs are better. I, I had to raise all these plants on my own. And the annuals, as fast as they were growing them, I was cutting them down to feed my caterpillars. And the shrubs were easier to, to maintain and they fed more caterpillars. So, you know, on some level, the shrubs are better, but also if you could grow a whole field of these annuals, Crotons, they could be useful if you had that need for some kind of um, captive rearing program or something like that. The altered disturbance re regime, I mean, this is true for, for many uh, uh, plants and animals still hanging on in, in the Everglades and the Pine Rocklands. Uh, this needs to be worked out. And I, I, it sounds like they're, they're making progress on that. And, and I hope they continue to do that because it's, it's a pretty crucial part. Um, predation certainly plays a role. I, I was finding this, um, a lot of Mark Salvato's work shows a lot of parasitoids tagging the, the Florida leaf wing caterpillars. So I think that's a big thing. And the seasonality, I'm not actually sure how that feeds into the Florida leaf wing. I'm not, I'm not, I don't know if that really helps in the conservation, but certainly it's something to keep in mind. And, um, and maybe that, that'd be an avenue where we could better understand um, some of the leaf wings in general. Um, yeah, so protect the remaining fragments. This is already in progress. Protect cater cat caterpillar stages from predators, um, burning regime, and captive rearing. For reintroduction of some of these fragments, um, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of permits and stuff for that and a lot of opinions on that, but that the leaf wings are not doing well on their own, for sure. Um, a lot of help and support in this. I was supported as a, an S fellow, uh, which is a, a, a joint position with the University of Miami and uh, Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden. Received a lot of support from the Botanic Garden and from their nursery manager um, and Tiffany Lum as well. Um, they helped a lot. Uh, funding through the University of Miami and also uh, the University of Texas Brackenridge Field Laboratory. Um, is a great little facility that they're similar to the Arboretum on the University of Miami campus. Every couple of years, they're fighting to keep it because it's like an 80 acre preserve right in the middle of um, Austin, right along the river where normally they sell, you know, really high dollar real estate places. And so they keep wanting to take it down, but it's, um, it's a great place to go see leaf wings. And then also my committee, this is all my dissertation work. So my committee uh, led by Carol Horvitz and Joyce Mashinsky, who's no longer at Fairchild um, and, and a lot of um, helpful people in that. And thank you and can take any questions. All right, thank you. Um, uh, we have time for probably like five minutes of questions. So um, who's up? Hi, I'd like to ask a question. Yes. So you had mentioned this is, has to do with the Texas species. I had no idea Texas got as cold as it does. You know, they just had that freeze with the windmills and all that stuff. Um, I know with the Atala butterfly um, that we talked a little bit before we started, that uh, she goes into a chill coma when the temperature goes below a certain point, which is kind of a quiescent, it's not really mm -hmm. a diapause. Uh, would you say that the, the leaf wings in the Texas area, that that dormant time that you're calling it, is that if you touch them, would they fall off, you know, the chill coma kind of thing? The adults or the, or the caterpillars? Either because the Atala both will happen if you touch them when they're in chill coma, they'll just fall off their plant. Um, and then after the temperature goes up, they'll crawl back on. Um, did you see that? I, I, I don't think that I observed that directly. Um, I did find now, so in, in my butterfly trapping, so I would, I had mesh traps that I baited with with um, fruit mesh that I would check, I mean, not fruit mesh. And at some point I wasn't clearing all the butterflies out in the evening. And I noticed they were very slow as adults and they wouldn't really want to move. And, and that was like, as the day was warming. 
And also uh, the caterpillar seemed to do okay when there were still like some freezing temperatures at night when the caterpillars were out. Um, I would certainly imagine that their activity would go really down and, and to something probably close to a coma. Um, and that's, I mean, you know, they're, they're highly dependent. You can see that on bees and, and stuff, or, or like if you have right. a fly, fly into your, your refrigerator, yeah, you know, they get kind of stuck. So I, I, I imagine don't think that's anybody but entomologists puts bugs in their refrigerator. They put dead birds and cow parts and stuff in their freezers. <laughs> you just said if you have a True. fly in your refrigerator. <laughs> True. Um, so yeah, I, and, and even in, and so in South Florida, you know, they still, not like the freeze they just got recently. Right. Texas. It's like, wait, we don't get weather like this, but um, well, we and went down to 28 that, degrees in Gainesville, and that's when I, I saw this chill coma occur. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's what I'm thinking they're probably doing in the Texas area, too. They're just, it's not really a, a diapause, but it's pretty close to that. Yeah. Yeah, and so I'm not sure. I'm not sure, and I never really figured out where the adults over winter or where they stay <laughs> and i've read like you know fissures in in bark or yeah. you know cracks i've read some of of like maybe it was in czechoslovakia about invalid using old mines and stuff like that you know it's so i'm sure they're creative um and also you know the the uh, morning cloak that's a butterfly that will come out in like february uh, in the northern states uh, when there's enough sunshine and this butterfly will suddenly appear. So it's doing the same thing. It's going into some kind of a quiescence somewhere and waiting for spring to lay eggs and start a new cycle. Yeah. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thanks. Do we have any other questions from the panel? All right, well, uh, Thank you for your enlightening talk. So um, it seems that there's, there's still a lot of work to do and you know, to fill in a lot of those gaps. Um, I do want to state real quick that it seems that the, the, the chrysalis stage is still a big mystery, not only for the leaf wing, but a lot of the other uh, imperil butterflies in South Florida. So maybe one day, <laughs> but- Well, and I could, in, in Texas, it was interesting. Um, in the spring, all of the fifth in stars would go pupate on another plant. And in the fall, I think because they had a shorter window, they would all pupate on the plant. And so you could, you could find them on the host plant, but I never found a single pupa on the host plant in the spring. All right, well, we'd like to thank you and we're gonna uh, wrap up with the uh, other stuff on the agenda. Um, remember, this is recorded, so you will be able to come back and you can see the presentation in full. Thank you. Thanks, that was an awesome talk. Thank you, thank you, this was great. All right, uh, okay, the mic on, the mic is on. Okay, so we are now, uh, we have announcements. Do we have any, I'm, I'm gonna give it back to, uh, to Dennis, our president. Yeah, thanks Jay. Um, I don't have anything in particular other than, uh, uh, I don't know if Linda I, uh, Evans is on the line. Uh, do you have dates for our upcoming uh, July counts for various uh, uh, 4th of July counts, uh, uh, Linda? Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I uh, proposed uh, July 19th for the Shark Valley count. I, I, no, I'm sorry. The Hold on. Let me go get my lens. No, Jay, uh, you probably could stop recording this. <laughs>